Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Fen Talks podcast. On today's episode, we're featuring Fenimore's Chief Diversity Officer and Employment and Labor Director, Ann Morgan, as we'll be diving into the important topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is this topic is nothing new for you. You have a lot of experience through several roles that you've had in the community, as well as what you've done to transition into some new roles within the firm. So before we dive into this really important topic, would you mind just sharing a little bit more about your background? Sure. I'm a labor and employment lawyer with the Finnamore, um, Finnamore Delling Aaron for those in Fresno. Welcome. And I um, serve on the state bar as the chair of the Blue Ribbon. Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I have a lifelong love of uh, trying to make this a better uh, place for people to live. Both of my children went to an at-risk school where they were in the minority. Uh, I believed that they would get a good education, but the better education would be what they'd get from meeting people not like them and learning to view people not by um, what they are, but by who they are. And another thing to know is your new role with the State Bar of Nevada. Would you mind sharing what that is? On June 17th, I'll be sworn in as the 10th woman president of the State Bar of Nevada. Congratulations again on that recognition and for, wow, I mean, that's such a great accomplishment and we're so excited for you. I'm um, looking forward to it. So you have been breaking barriers and you have, you know, done a lot within your professional career and, you know, women in law, we were traditionally the minority. And so I think there's some great success stories that are coming out of that. However, in the legal industry and in corporate America in general, there's still a long way to go. Um, Your passion is certainly very clear and we see that in a lot of the work that you're doing, but I'm curious if you would, you know, if you would mind sharing a little bit more about you know, how that passion has led into this new role for you as the chief diversity officer at Fenimore? Well, I, even though I'm very young, I am one of the first 100 women in the state of Nevada, which is kind of a surprise. In my law school, we had a good 40% of the women of the law students were women, but that did not translate into jobs. And even today there is a lag. I'm very passionate about providing opportunities. I have been very successful in my career and I wanna make sure that others will have similar success. So um, I've been following the conversation on diversity and equity and inclusion, um, certainly a lot more intently in the last year and a half, but what catalyzed it for me was hearing a colleague say to me, Anne, it is not enough not to be a racist. You have to affirmatively be anti-racist. That really resonated with me. Um, I think that diversity yields better results. I think it provides a better product. I think it um, gives better service to our clients, but you can't have diversity if you don't have a diverse employment group, um, if you don't have diverse clients, and if you don't have diverse vendors. And, And getting there is hard. It requires persistent and consistent effort. And I wanted to be in a position such as the chief diversity officer where I could apply that persistent and consistent effort to make that happen, at least with our firm. So the firm has had a diversity and inclusion council for a number of years now, but I do feel like those efforts have been amplified Mm -hmm. since you've stepped up in this role as the chief diversity officer. So would you mind just sharing what some of those initiatives are that that council has come up with for the for the next year? Um, I'd be happy to, but I can't take credit for um, being the author of this. Travis Pacheco, who is the head of our diversity council and the executive committee led by Phil Fargustine, Vicki Livingston and Cheryl Mostrom, all have had a role in developing uh, our current strategy. We believe that it's not enough to have aspiration, that you actually have to have action. But yes, it is hard. We have broken down uh, meeting our diversity and inclusion goals into six working groups. Um, The first working group deals with recruitment, getting people in the door. Where are we recruiting from? We've made an affirmative decision 
to go out and establish relationships with law schools that have a large, diverse student body. We've made a, a commitment to establishing relationships with minority bars so that when we have a job opening, we can pick up the phone and call and say, hey, do you have anybody who might be interested in joining a great law firm? Same with our staff. On inclusion and equity, that's our second work group. Um, we are working to take a look at our firm policies um, to make sure that we don't have barriers in our, our own policies. And surprise, surprise, one of the first things we noticed was uh, we have a men's dress code and a women's dress code. So we're examining why we have that. Education and training. This is a big topic for us. Um, most leaders need to listen hard, but they are not going to listen if they don't think there's something worth listening to. So we're going to educate and train all of our workforce and our leaders to um, understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion is all about, to figure out, to, to open minds that maybe the way we see the world is not the way others see the world, and why, and why maybe we ought to not make the same assumptions we may have historically made. Integration and retention, we're trying to figure out ways to, to promote all of our staff and all of our attorneys with equal opportunities to have great and effective mentors, to improve their skills, to provide great face time to those who are decision makers in the firm and in the community. Investing and serving, uh, we are going to put our money where our mouth is. We're going to invest firm dollars in diverse organizations in our respective communities. And that's in Denver, in Arizona, in Las Vegas, in Reno, and now in Fresno. And finally, belonging and socialization. We really think that it is a lot easier to, to understand another's perspective if you actually know who they are. So we're gonna provide opportunities for all of us to get together, to know who we are. Those are our six working groups and that is how we're gonna put action to aspiration. Something really exciting. And I'm so, I'm personally very excited to be a part of that. Um, and there are a number of individuals within the firm that continue to work really hard on this on a monthly basis. So curious, I mean, obviously there's a lot of moving parts and a lot that we're working on right now, but what, of everything that we're working on, what excites you personally the most? You know, what excites me the most is having conversations. Um, of trying really hard to have conversations with people who don't think the same way I do. And I'll confess that the first time I had one of those conversations, um, I watched a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> the takeaway I got from the video was, um, write down the goal. And of course, before I watched the video, my goal was change that person's mind. After I watched the video, the goal was have a conversation. It, um, it might just be that I would learn something if instead of trying to be just advocating constantly, I actually did a little more listening and engaged in a conversation to find out why people thought the way they thought and to be able to explore why maybe I think the way I think. I love that you brought up the idea of, you know, watching some YouTube videos, because even as leaders, we don't have the answers for everything. And we have to do a little bit of research and educate ourselves on a continual basis. Um, so part of this is having and getting comfortable with having those uncomfortable conversations in order to make real progress, we have to have them. So for those leaders out there in the business community that are preparing for some of these you know, what they feel like would be potentially uncomfortable conversations. What tips do you have for them? Well, um, you know, among the things that um, I have written down in my copious notes following YouTube videos and reading opinion columns and going to book clubs, I've never been to a book club before. Um, I think um, I think you have to stop saying, you know, um, I think that's a racist um, approach or I think you're biased. And instead, start asking more open-ended questions of the people who work with and for you and, and setting aside time to have those conversations with people who work with and for you. Why do you think so-and-so can't do this job? Um, maybe taking a hard look at your own contact list. If you're a leader in a firm, have you audited your own contact list? I did, and I was surprised to learn that most of my contacts uh, are not very diverse. So I've committed 
to increasing that percentage of contacts um, with more diverse people. And, and that's not just um, give me your business card and let me stick it in here. That is looking in my community um, for people that I don't know, but that I ought to. And I'm going to work really hard to do that. Leaders can do that. I know you continue to have these conversations, not only within the firm, but out there in the business community and with some of your clients and just, you know, other community stakeholders. So as you have been out there in the community and having those conversations, are there any key topics or trends that you see continually popping up? Uh, I think there is a real commitment among many businesses now to try to have a more diverse workforce. Intel um, several years ago passed a um, goal of having a certain percentage of its workforce be diverse, and it met that goal in less time than it set. So then it turned to its vendors and it looked out who was doing work with it. And among the people it's doing work with are attorneys, and they've now established the same goal for um, the attorneys that work with them. Those law firms have to have a certain diverse population working on their um, items. The big issue many of my employment clients have is, um, at least what they say is, I can't find anybody who's diverse. Can't find somebody who's diverse. Um, sometimes you have to go out and look. You can't just put the ad in the newspaper. So if you say, I can't find anybody who's diverse to come and work for me, then again, go back audit your own contacts, see where you're going to hire employees. Maybe you need to find a different place to go. Is the recruiting firm that you are using specializing in hiring diverse candidates? Or is the recruiting firm relying on their old established relationships? I know that's kind of been my habit in the past, and I'm going to try to expand those horizons. And clients are looking to try to do that too. Absolutely. I've started to see some of those exact same trends in my conversations out there in the business community. So, you know, I know aside from being the chief diversity officer, you also, you know, hold another really important role within our firm as a labor and employment director. And as you're having conversations with those clients, um, you know, has has your background in working both sides, like diversity and inclusion, as well as working in labor and employment, has that helped you in your conversations while you've been out there talking with people? You know, um, I really think that they say um, most business is about people. Most business is about people and employment is about people. So um, starting with the people side has been a real help because it helps you make sure you listen a little better, I think. Um, and I think if you listen a little better, you're willing to acknowledge that things are not always cut and dried. And if, if things are not always cut and dried in just general human resources, uh, you are going to be more receptive when it comes to thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. You may think a little differently when you're responding to a client about a particular employment matter because you have more expertise in the diversity side or the equity side or some of the issues there. You may have more affinity for helping your client get a more diverse workforce because you have spent all this time in the human resources arena trying to help the client manage a workforce so that they can get whatever their company's goal is accomplished. So yeah, I think it does help. And as you know, as we continue to be a resource for a lot of business leaders, I know there are a number of other resources out there. So are there any other that you would encourage um, people to look at? Are there websites, books, blogs that you think would be beneficial for people to know about? You know, if you are listening to this and you are, um, even if you are not an attorney, I encourage you to read the ABA's 21 Day Racial Equity um, Challenge. It is very, very eye-opening and um, not that hard to do, um, but hard sometimes to um, 
have to have that kind of introspection. I have found myself uh, reading poetry a little bit more. Um, I just read a Wall Street Journal article on Walt Whitman and how Walt Whitman really was talking about equity and diversity many, many, many decades ago. I, I would not have read that opinion piece, but for looking out for um, things that will improve my own training in education and diversity. I think there are books. Cast is a wonderful book, C-A-S-T, by Isabel Wilkerson. I find that to be a really interesting theory that uh, the caste system uh, is part of human nature, and it is what created both um, the caste system you have in India, but the uh, Nazi Germany situation, as well as what we have in America with the African-American and white issue. And I think the How to Be an Anti-Racist is a pretty good book to read. Um, uh, Corn Ferry, which is an employment agency, I'm going to give them a little plug here because they are putting out a pretty good leadership uh, email series on diversity and equity. So all of those things, once you start looking, it's just amazing what you can hear and how you can change um, or broaden your horizons and uh, I think, be a little more open to this being uh, a better world. So, Anna, as we'd like to wrap up today's conversation, is there anything else that you'd like to leave our audience with? You know, um, when I took the attorney oath, I remember one of the phrases in it, which was that I would promote the administration of justice. And I still take that oath very seriously today. We strive to be a more perfect union, but we can't be a more perfect union if we don't recognize that we're an imperfect union. And so I urge everyone to get a little more aware of why we are an imperfect union so that you can be part of the solution to make us the great nation that I believe we are. I really thank you for this opportunity, Lindsay. Thanks so much, Anne. So for those individuals that would like to connect with you on a deeper level or ask you a couple of questions, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? My email is amorgan at finnamorelaw.com, amorgan, finnamorelaw.com. And you can reach me at my direct line, 775-788-2204 or my cell, 775-742-4348. Wonderful. Well, Anne, thanks again for joining us for this really important conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you for the opportunity. 